Uh, Bill is a structural engineering partner at SOM, where he has led the structural engineering practice for over 20 years. Throughout his career, he has demonstrated his dedication to innovation in structural engineering through integrated practice, teaching, and professional activities. Perhaps best known for the buttressed core structural system of the Burj Khalifa, the world's tallest man-made structure, Bill's expertise extends to a variety of buildings at all scales. Among these are the Millennium Park Pedestrian Bridge and Pritzker Pavilion, the General Motors Renaissance Center, and the Broadgate Exchange House in London, which is the project where I first learned about Bill and what he does. This past summer, the work of Skidmore Owings and Merrill and their structural engineering practice was displayed in an exhibit titled SOM, Engineering X, Art and Architecture at the 2017 Chicago Architecture Biennial. And the exhibit was notable for its series of one to 500 models of well-known SOM buildings, rendered only as structure. And it's a fantastic exhibit if you get to, to see it as it travels or if you get to see it online. And notice that the structure, the form, the space are all available in these models even though only the structure is built. It's an absolutely fantastic exhibit. And I'm also proud to say there's a small model of Amy, the world's first 3D printed polymer building, also in that exhibit, uh, a project jointly with the uh, governor's chair for energy and urbanism. As I said when I started to introduce Bill, it's a great honor for me to do this. Uh, I, I learned about uh, the practice that Bill's been you know, pushing forward through the years. When I first looked at uh, this project, uh, I mentioned earlier the um, Broadgate Exchange House. I call it Exchange House, Broadgate Exchange House. What's fascinating for me, and I'm just going to mention this briefly as sort of a personal aside, when I was working on my thesis, I was looking for a project that compared space and structure in a way where they both sort of stood alone and did what they did, but they came together in a synthesis, a, a, a unity. And I have to say, that project for me it was fantastic. And for me to be in a point in my career where Bill actually knows who I am, is, it absolutely blows me away. So truly, it's an honor for me. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome William Baker. OK, anyway, I'm very pleased to be here. It's been a few years since I was last here. And uh, I love this building that you're in. It's, it's a fantastic place to learn architecture. Uh, the engineers should move over to a space like this, so <laughs> to the engineers in the back. Uh, anyway, so what I'm going to talk about, uh, architecture and structure in the computational age. And the image I have here on the screen is actually uh, somewhat ironic in the sense is that, because I'm going to talk about uh, just because we can doesn't mean we should, okay? Uh, this is a thousand foot building we did in Dubai where, where it rotates 90 degrees, so on and so forth. Uh, we, and it actually went together pretty easily, but, you know, the question is, we should think about it. Uh, you know, ar architecture is a story uh, of a time and place. H here you have this, this, uh, this hill town in, in Italy where my, tower is bigger, my family's tower is bigger than your family's tower uh, going on. And w everything you see there is architecture, and everything you see there is structure. Okay, you describe the structure, you describe the architecture. You describe the architecture, you describe the structure. Uh, and and if, if architecture is a story, the language is structure. Traditionally, the language is structure. And if your vocabulary is very limited, say you're a Mayan and all you have is a corbel arch, your architecture is quite limited. You know, the, the Greeks did pretty well with, uh, with a beam and post. I mean, really well. With just, that's a pretty limited vocabulary. And, and they went very far. You know, the Romans, of course, extended it <coughs> with, you know, the, uh, with arches and domes and the like. Uh, and, and made it better and better. And now, you know, but now let's move, go forward you know, a couple thousand years. Recent architecture. Hmm. What happened? One of those is an S1 building. Hmm. What happened? One of those is my building. <laughs> you know, and, and I go to cities like, like um, you know, Shanghai, or, you know, and I, I see, you know, all these things are going on, and you know, I see the uh, S1 Bagoda next to the KPF bottle opener, next to the shish kebab. <laughs> and, and, and when I look at these, and I, I think to myself, the movie Brazil. <laughs> Re remember the movie, uh, Ty Terry Gillum, who studied architecture, did he? Uh, anyway, so, uh, you know, here's uh, uh, Ida Lowry with her hat, okay? And, and I think of these buildings as well, they're wearing silly hats. Uh, and, and then, 
It makes me think about, if you, if you met this woman on the street, you would say, you'd, you'd notice her, right? But maybe not in the crowd. And so you see, all these bullies to me are like, you're having, you're having dinner in a crowded restaurant. Everyone is screaming, and you hear no one. They're, they're all drowning each other out with this, this cacophony of space. And, and, I, and I look at these tall buildings, and I think, uh, have we run out of good ideas? Have we run out of something? So as an engineer, uh, my, my thought is, can we create new technologies that will, that will by, night, by their nature, create new architecture that is meaningful and substantive? And, and so how can you do that? How can you create new topologies, new geometries uh, that will lead to new architecture? And so uh, here's, the, here's Exchange House in London. Anyway, uh, so, and I've come to the conclusion that it's through geometry. Geometry is the single most important uh, structural parameter, but it's also where, where architecture and structure intersect. You know, if you describe this building with the arch, you describe the structure, you describe the architecture. And, and you do it through the geometry of, of the system. And not, not only is it important for the intersection of architecture and structure, it also is very just very fundamentally important. I like this example <coughs> where you have uh, two cantilever trusses. They both do exactly the same job. It's a three to one cantilever. Uh, uh, the one on the left, for if you have equal stress in all the members, needs 27% more material. If you're concerned about deflection, and generally we are concerned about deflection, it needs 60% more material. The difference between the two is geometry. Yeah, and, you know, we're all about energy and all this kind of stuff. And if you want to get minimize your embodied energy in a building, get the geometry right. Okay. And uh, you know, over time, you know, obviously, uh, you know, operational energy, you know, is getting, you know, is is the big driver. But at the beginning of the building, it is primarily embodied uh, uh, carbon in the, in, the, uh, in the structure. And as we get better and better on the operational energy, it's going to be more and more part of the, the major problem. And on day one, about you know, three quarters of your, your, your uh, embedded uh, energy is in the structure. Now, OK, uh, now we, d we design in a world of limited resources, OK? Uh, but we're also in a world that's got to grow. You know, we can't just, you know, stop. Uh, we have limited wealth, but we need to create value. We need to create things. Uh, I, you know, I'd say we have a lot of uh, irresponsible excess going on, but we also have to be able to dream. So there's no right or wrong answer to this. And so as designers, whether you're a structural or as you, if you're an architectural designer, ask yourself, are you the facilitators of dreams? But are we also sometimes the enablers of willful excess? Okay. Now I'm going to show you an icon which I think is a facilitator of dreams, which you could argue is a very expensive way to make a restaurant. But, yeah, but you know, Paris would not be Paris without the Eiffel Tower. It, it's, you know, you know, even though it is, you might say, a folly, it is incredibly valuable. So you have to have dreams at the same time. So you know, I, I'm not saying that there's a right or one ounce, wrong answer, uh, answer, but you know, we certainly have to talk about it. What about willful excess? Okay, Phil. Okay, I'm, I'm chicken. If I if I, if I put up a building that I thought was willful excess, it'll turn out to be your favorite building, and you won't listen to the rest of my lecture. But we could all put a put an image there of a building that we felt was the was uh, an icon of willful excess. Okay, so um, the responsibility of as designers, uh, we need to have a position. Uh, just following orders is is uh, not an answer. Just because your client says you, they, this is what they want doesn't mean you should deliver it to them. Or or, uh, or if you're an engineer, just because the, uh, an architect draws something. Uh, so my candy doesn't mean you should make it stand up. Um, and so just because we can does not mean we should. And so the point I'm trying to make is there needs to be a critical discussion. You know, we need to discuss, discuss are we, is this a value? Is this, are we creating dreams or are we just being, uh, is, this, is it uh, irresponsible excess? 
And so I think a part of this, as designers, it, it's important to have a personal philosophy uh, and how that relates to the design. And, and I started thinking about this. I was doing a project with an artist named uh, James Terrell. Okay, now James Terrell, uh, we were working on this thing called Roden Crater, which is an extinct volcano uh, off in um, Arizona. And, and we we're going to design this, this piece, which hasn't been built yet, called the fumarole, which is in the first meeting, of the project meeting, I raised my hand, what's a fumarole? It turns out it's a, it's a side vent on a volcano. And so you can see the little side vent there. Uh, he wanted to make essentially a, um, right there, is that showing up? Nope. Let me try over here. Anyway, uh, so he, he wanted to make this, this a lunar observatory in the side of the mountain, side of the volcano. And so he had this uh, idea. It kind of has this kind of like bellows-like uh, formation uh, in, in the side of the volcano into this, this chamber, which is this 40-foot diameter eyeball, if you will, where it would project through a lens. So you see the moon rises, the moon settings for, uh, I think, 2,000 years with the design life uh, onto the back of, of the thing. And uh, before we got involved <clears throat> in the project, the project was a train wreck, okay? Uh, it, you know, everything was crashing each other. So what we did is we sat there, uh, we, we put hierarchy. We said, okay, the sphere is the alpha. It gets the right away. When it runs into something else, something else got to get out of the way, okay? And so we said, you know, so the sphere is the alpha. The, uh, you know, the, the uh, cylinder around it was, was the beta. And, and, so the gamma was the dome over the top, and then everything else worked around. And we, get, and we really, cl really cleaned it up. And then one time, James and I were given a, a presentation to a potential donor. And, uh, and so I described what we did. And at the end of it, I said, what we brought to the table was Miesian simplicity. Because I grew up in an office, a bunch of people used to work in Mises' office. And, uh, and so you know, I always thought of what we did was kind of Miesian architecture. And, and James, who's the artist, he's the author, he said, no, 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 Quaker simplicity. Okay? And I, being a Calvinist, had no idea what he meant. Okay, so I, I, I started going to uh, uh, Quaker services, okay, to understand what did James mean by no Quaker simplicity. And, and so, uh, since I'm not a Quaker, I can do a gross generalization of a whole religion. Uh, so, uh, but if, if you were uh, raised to, to believe in simplicity in speech, dress, food, and your mother, as James always says, J his mother always told you to step into the light, and you became an artist. So the, here are your ethical values. That they're, they're, they're not aesthetic values, they're ethical values. Simplicity and step into the light, and you became an artist. And this is what you would create. This is so minimal, it doesn't even exist. What your eye forms it. What you're looking at is a cutout in the corner of a wall, and the light is behind the wall, and your eye forms the pyramid. Simplicity and light. Uh, here's another project we did with James. This is uh, at Rice University, this, uh, this uh, sky space where it's about, you know, kind of this paint-thin roof uh, where, you, where you view the heavens uh, through the aperture. And so it made me start thinking, well, what are my ethical positions and how do they affect my aesthetic position? And so I, I started to make a list. Well, I'm an engineer. I believe in efficiency, okay? Um, you know, I believe in simplicity also. I like minimiz minimalism. I think economy is important. I hope I can design things that are elegant, like this. As you drive across the prairies of Illinois, and you see the, these unbelievably elegant uh, irrigation equipment. Um, uh, utility, you know, I, I don't like to do things that actually don't add value. Uh, but, but it also it needs to be harmonious. This is a piece we did with James Terrell, uh, James, uh, Jamie Carpenter. Um, order and hierarchy. Just like on, on, on the things with Terrell, what we set was order and hierarchy. By that is, you know, what's the hierarchy, you know, what are the elements? Uh, like uh, this is the, the base of that building that uh, James was talking about uh, in London. And so it's a tight arch. Every element there is essential, but they're not all equal. You know, what is the defining characteristic of the building? It's the tide arch. So the arch and the tide, they get the dominance. 
The column is, 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 is set back, it's, it's visually suppressed. It's, it's held back as you, as, you, as you express it. So it's, the it's not always the load flow, but in this case, it's highly related to it. So you have the arch coming down the tie, and then it sits on this, um, on this uh, uh, support, buttressed. Uh, anyway, uh, clarity, can you, can you just, uh, uh, show your systems? This is actually a house I did at uh, Ginny Gang. Or um, a proportion, you know, can you, uh, can you get it to the right proportion? This is a house you did with um, Tom Pfeiffer out of New York. Uh, one of the things I do hate, or I believe in it, is appropriateness. Now, I couldn't find a slide of appropriate, so I got a slide of inappropriate. This, I hate applied structure. I just hate it, okay? Th this person wanted a colonnade. Look at that. It's just ridiculous. And, I, and, and look at how the, I can't figure out how the garage works either. <laughs> look at that door. <laughs> okay. And, and I think it's, it needs to be a, a rational design. And, and, and as part of a designer, I think it behooves us to, to, that if we, to actually design buildings that we actually want to get built, that we're not paper architects or paper engineers. Uh, and to, to do that, one of my old bosses, Hal Anger, used to always say, have at least one idea how it can be built. All right, and um, you don't have to necessarily come figure it out yourselves. You know, take a contractor out for a beer and ask him. Okay, I want to get this idea. Figure out. Help me figure it out. Um, the uh, and you know, and this thing has corollaries. If, if there's at least one way to build it, there may be more than one way to build it. Uh, and if you and the 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 anti-corollary or whatever is, if you can't think about how to build it, it may not be buildable. Okay, so it's very important. So you know, think about how you're going to build it. Uh, well, one of the things I see in designers a lot of times, young designers, is they want to do something that's never been done before. Okay, don't be afraid to re-examine past uh, systems and solutions. The chair, problem solved. We're done. Let's never do it again. Okay, it's it's functional. We're, we're done, right? Well, Corbu had an idea, does the same thing, and then a few more, and a few more, and they're all great designs of a very, very limited problem, okay? So, you know, so, you know like the, the building we are talking about earlier, it's a tight arch. Tight arch has been around forever, okay? But don't be afraid to do it. Um, another thing that I find very helpful is describe your design in words. Okay, describe it. Now, there's a, a couple of quotes I think that, that relates to this. I did not have time to write a, a short letter, so I wrote a long one instead. Because if it takes too many words to describe your design, maybe you haven't figured it out yet. It's like when you Mark Twain write a letter, to write a really good letter, he needs to write it and then edit it and edit it and edit it you know, down to where it's really saying what it is. Uh, you know, uh, Winston Churchill has this quote, I'm going to make a long speech because I have not had time to prepare a short one. A and so, you know, and when you really, a lot of the projects I w I've worked on, or I've seen worked on by my predecessors at the firm, uh, sometimes you can actually get down to a noun plus an adjective. You, you can be that clear. And if you can be that clear, I'll, g I'll give you some examples first. Braced tube. Bundled tube. Buttress core. Okay? Now, if you can do that, maybe, and if th one of the things I find is don't name it too early. Let the, let the job kind of grow and flow and stuff like that. Because once you name it, you kind of lock it up a bit. Okay? But once you, once you've can describe it. And sometimes you can't get down to two words. But sometimes it's a sentence. If it's a paragraph, keep working. Okay. Uh, and um, but if you can do that, you can describe it to the rest of your team. It helps you resolve conflicts because tall buildings or buildings are all about conf resolving conflicts. It tells you who gets the right away. You can describe it to the other disciplines. You can describe it to the contractor, to the owner, and everyone gets it and says this is what is important in this design. And I don't think it applies just to structures. I think it applies to many, many things in life. 
Now, uh, one of the things I think is very important, and architects are much better at this than engineers, is know the past. Okay. One time I gave a lecture at st uh, uh, to a bunch of graduate students in engineering on um, uh, at Stanford University, and I, I had a list of names. I asked them, who, who knows who this person is? Boom, boom, boom. I went through it. Only one person knew who any of these people were. And that engineer had studied architecture as an undergrad. So, uh, you know, the, the engineers do not know their own history. And, you know, of course, we know the famous uh, quote by Newton, uh, if I have seen further, it's only by standing on the shoulders of giants. But the quote I really like, and I think it's the most appropriate, is by Picasso. Bad artists copy, great artists steal. Okay. What does that mean? To me, it means... What is the, don't copy the object, what is the idea behind the object? Take that idea and make it your own. Uh, you know, and so I've got a little working list of, of, of um, people who I think, mainly structural engineers, a few designers, a few artists who I think are, you know, like, of course, you know, you need to know about uh, Kenneth Nelson, the guy who did Tensegrity, you know, artist, or Jamie Carpenter. Uh, but you know, you know these are, you know, if we if you know their work, then you can st then you can steal their idea and create something they never did before. Or, or, or what I think is very helpful is to take ideas from different people and marry them. Uh, I, I once did this project in New York, never got built, where I I, t I took a a Felix Candela hyperbolic paraboloid, but I did it in steel and I stabled it like a Sukhoff did for the for the Goom department store. Okay, you know, you know, so you know. Candela was all in concrete, you know. Um, um, you know, Sukhoff, the Goom store, the Marble store is just a barrel vault. So, but you take, but, but there's there's certain ideas in there that you can take and marry and make something new. So now let me go back a little bit to uh, kind of where we are today. You, you know, I talked earlier about you know the you know what's in the past. You know, the Roman arch, you know, the Roman dome, uh, the Gothic buttresses, which are incredible structures. And here the geometry, and all, well, first of all, all these are totally driven by geometry. In masonry, if the geometry is not right, it falls down. If the thrust goes outside the masonry, particularly if you don't have any mortar or rebar, and these guys didn't, or the mortar is long since gone and the rebar, uh, you know, there might have been a little bit in there, but. Um, and you go to, go to the Gothic, you know, that whole thing, that whole geometry is totally about keeping those thrust inside the masonry. And, and you look at, like, say, the Gothic vault. Here, this is King's College in Cambridge. Um, and uh, that stone up here at the top is only four inches thick. Not reinforced concrete, no rebar, just, you know, mortar was long since gone. Uh, okay, you know, in the more t modern times, you got the work of a Guastafino with his masonry shells. A lot, of, a lot of which were, he could actually do without uh, much fa false work, you know, because they, they would uh, span themselves. I talked about Sukhoff and, you know, his famous uh, hyperboloid uh, towers that, that, that he did. Of course, um, Robert Maillard, who did all of, his, all of his designs graphically, he would, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, he would calculate the forces graphically, not with a calculator, graphically, not with a slide rule, graphically. He would measure the forces with a ruler. Uh, you, you have Taroha, you know, uh, the, you know, the beautiful work of Luigi Nervi. This inside geometry is it's much driven by the, con the concrete technology, the precast concrete. You know, if your segments are all the same length and you keep lighting them up as the, as the diameter gets bigger, the angle changes. You know, uh, I mentioned earlier Felix Candela with his amazingly thin, uh, very clever, very, very limited vocabulary, hyperbolic paraboloid, very limited, and did these incredible, uh, these incredible structures. Bucky Fuller with his shells. Heinz Eastler with his hanging models. You know, where you take the, the, wet, uh, the wet fabric, he would let it harden and then measure it to, to create his shells. Diesta, which is unbelievable. These unbelievable brick cantilevering shells. You know, they didn't have rhino. They had ideas, okay? They, you know, you, you've got, uh, you, know, you know, of course, Fry Otto with all of his experimentation with the soap film, you know, leading to, you know, the Munich Olympics. 
or stuff like the, uh, the, the Mannheim, um, uh, temp this temporary structure that's been around for, what, you know, 40 years, because it's so nice they, they wouldn't let them tear it down. So what tools did these people do as we, as we take, you know, design to, to today? Well, theory, a very simplified calculations, experimentation, intuition, and experience, okay? Those are probably, you know, the set. So there's been a fun, going back to this conversation we need to have about design, there's been a fundamental change in how we design. In the past, it was a, a lack of computational power. Uh, if you look at Frank Lloyd Wright's My Hell Tower, Tower Drawing, he lists like 11 or 12 names. He lists one architect, uh, uh, Louis Sullivan, and all the other names were either structural engineers or people who had patents on reinforced concrete. Uh, and, and three of those uh, names were uh, structural engineering professors, okay? Hardy Cross, uh, uh, George Biggs from Princeton, and uh, uh, Polifka, a professor from Berkeley. And all three of those guys were doing research in indeterminate design because Frank Lloyd Wright could not do everything he wanted to do because engineers couldn't calculate indeterminate structures very well. So today is how to harness the computational power. In the past, the conversation is what shape will work, and too often it's turned into how do you make the shape work, which is fundamentally different. What will work? Make it work, even if it's not a, a reasonable, uh, of any reasonable, or it's a, if it's of questionable architectural, uh, structural merit. And so, Maget and others are trying to harness the power of the computer to try to create things which do make sense, that have logic. You know, using tools like Karamba, uh, Kangaroo, uh, what else you're using, whatever. Uh, you know, and you know, using uh, Galapagos and, you know, uh, genetic algorithms, things. Um, but one of the important things as we do these things, maybe you get better shape, but also you need to get insight. Is, you know, so you got something. What's it, what have you learned? You got, okay. And you got to remember the purpose of computing is insight, not numbers. And so for me, one of the most questions, well, I come up with a solution. For me, even more, question, more important is that what it is, is why is it what it is. And if you can understand why it's doing this, then maybe you can innovate and do something. You, you can just change the problem and come up with something that, that you, you didn't think about. Okay, so in our, in our work, you know, this trying to get rid of the silly hats on buildings. Uh, you know, uh, we've been doing a, a lot of research in geometry and design, and uh, we've come up with this vocabulary, like what matters? Okay, we have what we call the design domain, that gray box, and then we're, there, there are three geometric exercises. One is topology, which is what is connected to what. Shape, how do you take that topology and shape it? How do you move it around? And then size, how big are the members, how big are the joints? And to paraphrase Hardy Cross, uh, Hardy Cross, what he, what he said, something like uh, equilibrium is essential but otherwise unimportant, something like that. Anyway, so the sizing of these members is essential but otherwise unimportant. Okay, you've got to get it right, but it's not defining. Those topology and shape is what we might call architecture. And in that example I showed at the beginning, if you get the wrong topology or shape, you're dead from the beginning. You can never, you, you, you've, you've set a barrier as to how efficient you, your, your building can be. So issues with how we design today. Graphic tools are often running over good structures. I'm sure you, you get it, right? <laughs> uh, a lot of times, even the engineers, linear thinking is wrong. We put it in the computer and we see what comes out. All right, um, question, okay, uh, and you, you know it's going to be a trick question. Which stool has the highest forces? The four-legged stool. Why? Because maybe the floor is unequal and at high centers. Uh, in the three-legged stool, if you put a load in the middle, you know you have one-third, one-third, one-third. In the four-legged stool, your load is somewhere between zero and 50%. You don't know what it is because it's indeterminate. Now, if you, if you, you know, this is Ando, who, who steers? Alter, 
alto. Anyway, so he made it nice and springy so the, load, so the, so the legs would get loaded, you know, and stuff like that. But, uh, uh, but you know, but fundamentally, you know, you know, we do all these computer analysis where we have these tremendously in, in, uh, indeterminate structures, and we just assume that the load goes where the computer says it is, where it's, it's probably not at all. Construction errors and whatever makes it. So, uh, so, so here's the question. You know, make it work is my point is make it work. I feel it's too common. Can we move beyond design by analysis? Because a lot of times what we do is we do these parametric studies. We take a shape. Eh, it's not doing so well. We've changed some parameters. It gets, maybe it's doing a little bit better. Uh, and so it's like iterative analysis. Okay. And we all do it. That's, that's the way we do it. You know, but can we create a, you know, accessible design tools that provide insight? And as I said earlier, can we provide why something works in addition to what works? And so one of the ways we're looking at is can we create uh, structurally based visual design tools that may give you insight? And, uh, and design is not black or white. And a lot of times people think engineering is black or white. It is not black or white, okay? There's a whole range of possible answers. Uh, you know, that, you know there is a, there's not one right answer. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's a whole lot of freedom in this, uh, but you still have to be looking for it. And so we need to tame the beast. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, this is going to be somewhat metaphorical, uh, thinking and designing and geometry. Okay, I'm going to go back to a problem that uh, a good 19th century engineer or architect would be able to do quite easily, which is, let's say you had this beam with loads and reactions, and you wanted to design an arch or a funicular, you would do it, do it with a ruler. You would draw your, your, your loads and reactions. You'd put a dot on the piece of paper, and you draw a straight a series of lines from that dot. And you would then, using parallel lines, create a funicular. This, this is my wall in my office. Works. OK. If you don't like that one, move the dot. Oh, but I want an arch. Well, put the dot on the other side. OK? And so and in the process, the designer gets an idea of what matters and how to do it. Because you're doing it, you know, we're, we're creatures who are visual and tactile and, and in ways that I don't understand. Um, you know, so one of the things I like to talk about is graphic statics and visual insight. There's a, uh, in the 19th century, you would have designed a structure using uh, graphic statics on the, on the left is a, you would analyze the structure with just a ruler and a straight edge. Uh, so uh, on the left is the structure, on the right are the forces. So the, the force in member F5 is the length, sorry, F10, is, is, the, is, is the force in this member F10. So you'd measure it from F to 10, and that would tell you the force in that member. And, and, and you just do this you know, graphically, and everyone used to know how to do this. Now, no, now people are starting to learn it again. Um, and so I'm going to talk about using graphic statics as a design tool, because you know, everyone say, well, I can run analysis of this. I, can I don't have to get out a ruler and a straight edge. Uh, you know, I can just put this in the computer and get an answer. I'm, I'm talking about design, not analysis. So can we use graphic statics as a design tool? And, and using this as a metaphor for all types of design tools, so let's say uh, you've got this roof, and here are your applied loads and reactions, and you want to have, uh, you want to use the same beam for the rafter, so you want all the members uh, on the, you know, the next to A, B, C, D, E, and F to be the same force. Well, what am I going to do? Draw the forces. Don't draw the structure, draw the forces. Okay. Boom. They're all the same force. Because you made it, so by designing the forces, not designing... Uh, the structure, and then you start connecting the dots. You have now got a structure. You've just designed a geometry, a shape, wh wh which puts all the forces in the um, in the rafters the same. Now, who would actually do that? Maillard did it about 90 years ago in Switzerland. Okay. Now it's a little spooky. He left out the diagonals. Okay. Why do you do that? Let's look at the, let's look at the force in, say, member 2, 3, or member uh, 8, 9. 8, 9 is a dot. There is no force in the member. So he left it out. 
Now, he, he, he also beefed up the members a little bit so you get some Virendil action for unbalanced loads and the like, so you got to be a little careful. Uh, uh, he designed, you know that bridge I showed earlier? That beautiful bridge in Switzerland? He designed those things graphically. And you can imagine if you're drawing the forces at the same time you're drawing the structure, you, you, they would have to inform each other. Well, there's a lot of research going on in this. This is some work from Belgium. We're uh, trying to create modern graphics. Uh, on the left is the uh, structure, on the right is the forces. Uh, there's a group out of Zurich, uh, uh, Fleet Block, who by designing the forces, you can ensure yourself that that's, that shell is totally in compression because you only draw compressive forces. And, and by setting up your, so uh, this is the 3D view of the structure. That's a 2G projection and these are the forces. And, and so if you put out your forces in just a certain way, you can guarantee that you only have compression. Just like the, you don't have to be like the Gothic mason who just builds it until it falls down and tries again. Uh, you, you can do this graphically. And in the feedback, lately we've been doing some 3D graphic statics using parallel lines, which is called the Cremona approach. Uh, this is a, a uh, pedestrian bridge we were looking at in, uh, in Thailand. And so we had this walkway over this uh, roadway. Uh, and we want to support it on, on a, a very, we want to use a very delicate arch, so we want no bending. So we did three-dimensional graphic statics, where you draw the, uh, so this, this top line, this red line, is the, is the walking surface, the deck, and this purple line is the, uh, is the supporting arch, and these green lines are the members that connect the two. And here are the forces. Here, the purple lines, which is the supporting arch, radiate from that point, and the length of the lines is proportional to the force. The, um, um, this vertical blue line is the gravity loads. Uh, this green line is among the connectors, and these red lines are the forces in that deck. And if you set it up in such a way that it closes, you know you have no bending. And, and you do that just totally graphically. And so any two-dimensional projection of a three-dimensional graphic statics is a two-dimensional graphic statics problem. So here's what it looks like straight on. Here's what it looks like from the side. And here's what it looks like from the top. And then, of course, we have to throw it in the computer. And sure enough, it's all pure axial, very little bending. And of course, you know, being who we are, we have to write a, a rhino. You have to get up rhino and do a, do a grasshopper script, right? Is this thing working? Yeah, there you go. So, so you know, it turns out there, there's very few parameters you have freedom to play with in order to get this thing to close. You know, we set certain rules. So, so then you know, the design team can sit there and you know, pull the levers and and get get this thing so where it works out. Um, uh, another application of graphical stuff. Uh, this is a piece of art we're doing with a, a woman named Janet Eckelman. She's an artist who does work in fishing nets. Uh, this is in Los Angeles. If you look up on the hill between those two buildings with the white roof, just above here, you see a little shadow of something there. Let me zoom in a little bit. Uh, there's the, uh, th these nets, design space. And so we had th this, th this sculpture piece that's between these two, and we were, we were playing with uh, those horizontal nets is what you use to stress it against. I think it's absolutely beautiful. It's beautiful art. It's beautiful structure. It's equilibrium. It's all in equilibrium. And so using that, uh, we, we've, been, we've been studying you know, how, to, how to play with the topology of, of, of nets, uh, of spider webs, if you will. And then using something called force density, uh, which uh, to make sure it's in equilibrium. So you, now, one of the problems we had on this one is because it's a redundant load path structure, we had a couple of ropes that were slack, and so we, we've been studying how to fix that. And so, um, so here is graphic statics on a net. And, and, and it turns out it's totally reciprocal. This is the structure, and these are the forces. Or is this the structure, and those are the forces? Either could be true. It's a reciprocal process. And, and, and from here, using something called area stress function, you can figure out how, you know, how redundant it is. It turns out the one on the left has three states of cell stress. And so we played with the topology. We took out some members. And we ended up with a structure on the left that has only one state of cell stress, which means the one on the right has no mechanisms. They're related. 
It turns out the number of states of cell stress and the number of, of mechanisms, this is for the engineers in the room, uh, are, are, are related through graphic statics. Because both of those are projections of plain face polyhedra, the area stress function. So what we do, we need more tools. So we, we've been working on the toolbox. These are the toys that we have plus others. Some commercial tools, some academic tools. Uh, you know, we have, we're doing a lot of stuff with uh, Voronoi finite meshes and where this a tool called Polytop, uh, Glossio Polino uh, developed this. And so uh, you grow a structure. You're not gonna design that, but it gives you an idea. And you, and you start studying, why is, it, why is it the right answer? Now, a lot of times the tool will bias the answer. So we'll use multiple tools. It's called a ground structure. We have like thousands of lines connected to each other. And you, and you slowly throw away the ones that aren't doing any good. And so this gives you a different set of information. Uh, we've been doing studies on discrete uh, Mitchell trusses. Those are called Mitchell trusses. Um, and this entire Mitchell truss can be described with one angle. The, the, the leading angle is, 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 is that alpha angle is the same on every one of them. So, and, we, and so, you know, we, we use these to so look at problems and we're not sure what's, what's a, a possible solution. And you see what it grows. You're not going to build that, but it gives you ideas that, that, that you might apply. Uh, you know, and going back to Mitchell himself, you know, he solved a series of problems. Uh, but, it, but there's only a very limited number of problems that have been solved by Mitchell back in 1904, by the way. Um, and so, you know, we can use th this tool to, like, say, play with the boundary conditions. You can either grow an arch or grow a hanger by, by, pl pl by playing with the, and then interpret it. Say, how do you want to build it? Um, the, uh, and we've been applying this to buildings and, and studying how, how the loads want to turn down, you know, some, some optimal geometries, which are starting to show up in our architecture. Uh, and, you know, just, you know, here's, so a lot of times what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll use these multiple tools, and, and this, this tool gives us one answer, this tool gives us another. And so you look at them, you get a cup of coffee, get some trace paper, draw something. Okay, it turns out this, this thing is within 5% of the perfect answer. Okay, because we've been able to benchmark to know how, how low you can go. Um, now, if you, if you did a normal Pratt truss, which you see all the time, so the, the ground structure, which you can't get to, this one for same deflection as the ground structure needs 5% more material. If you did a Pratt truss, it needs 68% or 63% more than that truss. We have got to find these new geometries and start applying them in architecture. If you can save that much carbon by getting the right geometry, can we move beyond nerves? Okay. And for me, that this is a meta, another metaphorical. One of the greatest structures, I think, is this thing by we didn't do it. Is by uh, uh, Foster and Burrow Hoppold and Professor Chris Williams uh, from uh, Bath University, and Professor Williams. Uh, wrote a series of equations for the design team. He wrote three different equations with variables, and if the design team could play with those three levers and come up with a, a shape that, that would match the, the, the design space, but also have good structural behavior. And so can we create tools that can do that? That, that can, you know, this is for the researchers in the room. Can you create new design tools that give you the right levers? Just like Chris Williams said, you, know, you can play with A, you know, you can play with, you know, A, B, C, D, uh, uh, you know, those are your variables, okay? And, you know, and if you play with those, that's the range, and you'll get an answer that works. Can, can, we, can we do that? And, and, you know, Karamba and those things are, are part of that, but also understanding why is very important. Now, I'm going to very quickly talk a little bit about the Verge and the Butch's core system, just uh, kind of uh, finish it off here. Um, and so some of the things that we went through on, on this one. Now, it, I ask you, and I'm not, I'm, uh, is, it a, is it a dream or a willful excess? Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you have to ask yourself. Anyway, so uh, uh, I have an opinion, but I'm too close to it. Okay. Uh, anyway, so it, it was, um, 
it was, um, I think, 65% built taller than the, anything that had come before it. Um, there, were, there were two things, uh, two issues that you should know in a tall building. One is there are giant beams coming out of the ground. If you look at the Sears Tower or the Willis Tower or whatever they're going to call it tomorrow, and you, and you see it a, as thousands of beams and columns, that's too complex. Your mind can't deal with that. Think of it as just one giant beam with some holes in it. Okay? And actually, if you look at the base of the building, you look at the stress distribution, that acts like a giant box beam with four webs. You, you know, and that's how it, how it behaves. Another important issue is issues of scale. Uh, you know, and you know, Gal here, you know, here's Galileo's famous drawing of these bones, which kind of exaggerated a bit. Uh, you know, and this is, you know, if you look at uh, Darcy Thompson's Growth and Form, which is an incredible book, uh, you know, where he talks about, he's, he's basically a um, biologist, is, is as much an engineering mechanics guy as he is a biologist. And, and he talks about, well, things in nature look like they do because of the physics of the world they live in. And our architecture should react to the physics of the world we live in. I'm talking structural, but it's also environmental. And, and so clearly, you know, the, you know, the bone structures of a dog and an elephant are, real, are similar, but not the same, quite different. And so, it, you know, if I were twice as tall, I'd be twice as wide, I'd be twice as thick, I would weigh eight times as much, okay? And so, you know, you just can't scale things up. So when you have a new problem, you have to come up, you got to throw away the old system. If you took the Sears Tower and you scaled it up, it scales by the cube. It's just too big. The floor plates are too big. You know, the volume's too big, too much floor area. You can never sell it all. Whereas the Burj only scales by the square. If I make it twice as tall, it has twice as many floors, and the, and the wings are maybe twice as long, but they don't have to be any wider because of the system we, we came up with. And, and in the design process, our first design was 518 meters which was like 10 meters taller than the tallest building. And that building actually did not work. We had a big problem. And so we changed it quite a bit. And, and after a couple of years, it grew to 725 meters. And eventually, from thereafter, it was like 828 meters, which is about half a mile tall. And so, uh, which is big. You know, uh, <laughs> give you an idea, you know, if we were in Chicago or, say, New York, or London, okay. Of course, you say it doesn't belong in the in the city; it belongs to Canary Wharf. Yeah, that's okay. Of course, uh, Trump wants one. <laughs> okay. Uh, the uh, you know it's right, yeah, but it doesn't have it has a lot of area, but not that much area for a big building. It's like you know, three million square feet in the tower, a couple of million in the base, about a five million square feet um, to the, all together. It has. Um, it's mostly residential. The pink is boutique offices, which was a late, very, very late change in the design. The, the green at the bottom is Armani Hotel. And they were able to sell the blue and the brown and the yellow. Is that right? You know, my color's right here. In about uh, two days, in 2004. And of course, you know, these weren't bought, bought by mom and dad looking for a retirement home. Uh, th these were bought by uh, speculators, and they would like and they had to put up 50% of the cost of the building within six months, or the cost of their unit within six months, and that financed the, the tower. Uh, the vertical transportation, you know, the things that, the, the, def the defining things of a tall building, uh, when the, when the um, home insurance building was done in the 1880s, is the same as today, structure and vertical transportation. And so vertical, tra how do you get it all in there? Uh, this uh, building has, I don't know, I, mean, I can't remember, there was 50, 50 elevators and about 32 shafts, because you have double-deckers and sky lobbies. And the way the elevator can work is you take like a, uh, an express elevator from the ground to a sky lobby, and then you get it, like here you take it, uh, and then you get into the, to, to the local uh, elevators to go to your floor. But there's, you know, from here down, you actually go from the ground up to here, but these other floors, you go to a sky lobby and transfer over to, to get to your floor. So it's like taking an express train and then getting on a local train. At the time, there was not an elevator that could go over half a, mile, half a kilometer. And so th this is a, a service lift, a freight elevator. It goes up 500 meters, and then we had to transfer because we couldn't uh, get, get the cabling to go that far. Nowadays, you can't. Uh, and so what made it possible? Structural engineering systems, wind engineering, 
integration and construction technology. Uh, it's a giant concrete building, mostly concrete, pretty uh, you know, with a steel spire at the top. Uh, pretty conventional in many ways. One time I was giving a lecture in Japan, in Korea, and the, this guy, one of the professors in the, in the audience, was just laying into me for not doing something more innovative. And I, and I was thinking, I wanted the building to actually get built. Okay? So if you're going to tell somebody, you're going to try to get a bunch of contractors to build the world's tallest building with a system they've never done before, good luck. Okay? So what we wanted to do is we wanted to give them conventional systems and just arrange it in an unconventional manner. So it's walls, slabs, and a couple columns. If I were to do it again, I'd get rid of the columns. Just have walls and slabs. Uh, we, we called it a, a, a buttress core. So you got this hexagonal core in the middle, which takes care of all the twists so this doesn't thing go like a, like a pinwheel. And then it's buttressed, like the Gothic cathedrals, it was buttressed by the three wings. So it's like if the wind is coming against that face, this wing braces the other two wings. Uh, and so, I mean, this is the structural system of the Burj Khalifa. So here's the guy, he's, he's taking the wind of his umbrella, his front leg is, is the core, and his back leg is the buttress. Uh, you know, of course, we had to keep moving the gravity. Uh, gravity is your friend in a tall building. Uh, you know, use it to help resist the wind. Uh, you don't, they don't forget to put it in. Uh, it doesn't matter if the inspector's there or not, the gravity still shows up. Uh, and so, but you've got to push it out and move it out. And so if you get to the bottom of the building, this is the rebar at the bottom of the world's tallest structure. If you just walked up to the site, how tall would you say that building is? Five stories? We had zero tension, even under a storm that happens once every 1,700 years. Okay? No tension. Which makes it a lot of expense. We use this magic, incredible material called concrete. It's like it, they should give it a new name, okay? It's unbelievably strong. It, it behaves, you know, like that puddle, you know? Uh, you know, you know it's, it flows. It has all these problems. Very high stiffness, very high modulus. And, and you know, so we use this, you know, pretty amazing stuff. Um, wind engineering. As wind goes past an object, it tends to cause vortices. It goes by and makes a building rock from side to side. And, it, and if it matches the harmonics of your building, you can get some very big forces like a kid on a swing. If the kid kicks their feet at the harmonics of the swing, they go very, very high. And so what we did is we did a whole, like I said, the very first building we designed didn't work, OK? So we had to go back and, and because of the wind problem. And so we, we did a tremendous number of studies. And we determined the building had essentially six directions, three tails where the wind comes between two wings and three noses. And when the wind came across the nose, it was fairly benign. But when it hit the tails, it was not benign, a vortex would peel off and, and blow against the third leg. And so what we did is we, we played with the, uh, the shape of the, of the architecture. The single most important parameter in a tall building structurally is the architecture, the, the, what you might call massing. And so we played with the shape of the building. And he, here's the very first an analysis on the left. See that big, uh, the red line is a 100-year storm. And by the time, uh, there's a 1,000-year year storm. Anyway, uh, so. Uh, by the time we reshaped the building uh, twice, the forces had dropped from that dotted line down. And, and because of that, we were able to go higher and higher and higher. Uh, we then tuned the building like a musical instrument to, to try to get away the harmonics. Uh, we, we, so we played with the, the, the mass, the stiffness, and the mode shape. We actually played with the mode shape to try to get, move off axis. And so uh, here's, here's how the design went. went from our initial design so if you have 100% base moment, 100% acceleration, how much it moves, our final building had less base moment than that building, even though it grew by 300 meters. 300 meters is the height of the Eiffel Tower. That's how much it grew. Uh, the, uh, uh, the accelerations went down. We even tested a taller building, which worked even better, but it had a hot spot about 40 stories up. And we didn't get this data until we were, it already built the 40th floor, so we, we couldn't change it. Uh, construction technology. Um, you know, a bunch of piles. Uh, w uh, one of the things we, we were uh, worried, you know, we're going to try to pump the concrete 600, 2,000 feet in the air. And we, so we said, okay, how do you figure that out? So they, they ran in pipes back and forth across the, 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 uh, the desert, and this guy, I keep on talking about Hardy Cross, he had this way of calculating hydraulic loss in a piping system. 
And so they had enough uh, uh, hydraulic pressure loss to equal pumping 2,000 feet in the air. And then they tried different concrete mixes and see what, if it was still concrete that came out the other end. And then off they go. These are like a vertical factory. They just jacked themselves up. Now the cladding contractor went bankrupt on us, so you got to see the structure for a long time. And eventually they got somebody to, to take over the contract. They had to start in the middle and go both ways. And then um, it got up to the spire. Uh, and the, the spire was, it was so high you couldn't get a crane up that high, so we had to build the spire inside the building and then hoist it out. So it's actually, it's actually you know, hanging inside the building on, on this, this, this base here, which is actually like a lazy Susan. So what we did is we, we would jack it up and then we'd rotate this thing about that bolt, you know, 60 degrees and then set it down. It's up and up. Somebody has to change the light bulb. Uh, it gets hit. Oh, by the way, we did a whole bunch of wind tunnel studies on this. See those blades on the side of the, of the spire? That's the break up the vortex shedding on the spire. We, we, ch we tested a whole different series of patterns. It's the lightning rod for the city of Dubai. So it's, it just, uh, I was there, I've been there when the storms, and it's just like hit like every five minutes. Boom. You know, I talked to the people who work there. It doesn't damage the building. It's all grounded. And it's also grounded like a Faraday cage because you're as likely to get a side strike as a top strike. And so the outside of the building is grounded to the structure down to the ground. And because the groundwater is so uh, corrosive, we had to use uh, the stainless steel ground rods. So there it is. You're above the clouds. They eventually washed the windows, which is nice. <laughs> it looked a lot better. There you have it. Catches the light in amazing ways. And then they had the grand opening in uh, 2010, January. And I was there, I think, because the height of the building was a big secret, and I knew how tall it was. So I was thinking, <laughs> but I didn't know they changed the name. <laughs> so instead of like a Burj Khalifa, because up till that day, it was called the Burj Dubai. And then uh, I was sitting there next to a guy who speaks Arabic. He said, well, they, they call it after Sheikh Khalifa. I said, who's Sheikh Khalifa? <laughs> well, he's the Sheikh, of, 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 he's the sheikh from uh, Abu Dhabi. Okay, all right. Anyway, so then they, you know, sell off the fireworks, and I was sitting there as a structure engineer thinking, this is not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but, uh, you know, uh, it takes a lot of people to build it. Uh, we only draw it, the contractors build it. And the guy, uh, 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 K.J. Kim, it was, uh, was from uh, Samsung Construction, was the guy who led it. Uh, the number two guy was the guy behind him, who's a, who's a Belgium guy from B6. And then the, uh, the li most of the laborers from a third firm called Arab Tech. And so it takes a hu huge number of people to do these projects, a huge number of firms. And I've gone on way too long, so I'd like to say thank you. Can we take a few questions? Sure, if people don't want to run out the room. I'm sure there are questions. <laughs> All right. Um, you said the enclosure contractor went out of business, and do you want to tell us why? Uh, they, I think it was just more, they, it wasn't our job. Our job didn't put them out of business. It was some other project. You know, uh, okay, if I were an investor, there are two things I would not invest in. One is a design firm, okay, because if the, you know, the talent walks out the door, you have nothing except liability. And number two is an exterior wall contractor. Because if they have a problem on a job, you know, they got thousands of problems on a job just because of the repetition. So look at a lot of the famous couples and all these other firms in the past. They're not around anymore. So it's, you know, it's, it's a dangerous business. But I don't know. If, so if I, unless a later, I think it was Far East Aluminum took over the job. It was a Swiss firm that was doing it originally. But, uh, uh, but we didn't put them under. It was somebody else. <laughs> Uh, we, well, uh, one of the things we did is, uh, first of all, I've actually walked down the tower, you know. I didn't walk up, okay. 
I, you know, I was actually looking for cracks, you know, so I had one of the engineers give me a plot of where all the most highly loaded uh, link beams were. I actually couldn't find any cracks, um, which maybe we over-designed. I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, but uh, it took me about 45 minutes, and I was actually doing inspection all the way down. But we have, um, uh, we have a, a whole series of uh, um, stairs. We have, uh, towards the base, we have three sets of stairs, and you have what we call areas of refuge where you can rest for a while. But also, the elevators in this building can be used as, uh, particularly the ones that are on the sky lobbies, can be used for exiting. They're called lifeboat uh, exiting, where there's actually cameras and things that the fire marshal can inspect the, the elevator shaft to see if there's smoke or anything in, in the uh, elevator shaft. And if the, if the shaft is OK, then the fire marshal can activate the shaft and bring people down certain elevators. So that, that's part of it. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming out uh, today. That was a really great lecture. Um, I'm, I'm wondering where um, excess can meet reality, um, not in terms of structure, and where SOM is, uh, you know, apart from the structural realm. Well, so uh, like, the whether it's like in interior fittings or exterior fittings. Well, you, you know, I mean, um, you know, it, it's it's a it's a constant struggle. Okay. Now, we're a little bit fortunate because we have like a, 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 several years ago, the design partners got together, and I'm considered one of the design partners. So the uh, it's, so there's design partners, including Phil Inquist, the urban planner, and the interior design partner, and then the, all the architectural design partners got together. We, it's talked about, because our firm has been around for over 80 years. So what is it, who are we today? Why are we together? Why are we even working together? And so we had to have a common value. And so we, we came up with the following three attributes which we feel should be part of any um, uh, SOM project, and hopefully all three of them, at least one of them, simplicity, structural clarity, sustainability. And so, so we kind of limit our, our palette. You know, d design is a search for constraints. You know, uh, Picasso drew in blue for a while. You know, not that he didn't have other colors. He constrained himself to do that, okay? So this is our constraint. These are our values. Um, this is our ethical position. Uh, and so, um, you know, so that that helps a, a bit. You know, now occasionally we'll we'll we'll, we'll have somebody who goes off the goes off the reservation, you know, and does does something that's a bit, you know, too much. Um, and um, but we we do try to be responsible in our in our, but also still creating delight at the same time. It's you know it's, uh, but quite frankly, a lot of these buildings, have, you know, they're very very expensive. If if you're very wasteful, it doesn't happen. You know, it's, it's kind of somewhat self-limiting, unless you're in New York City or someplace where the, 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 the sales rates are so unbelievably high, you can be totally wasteful. Um, and you see that in a lot of the New York buildings. Well, one of the things I, reason I think Chicago is kind of the capital of American architecture is because it was always a, the rents were always low. So the architecture had to be quite rational and reasonable and thoughtful. Because if you're wasteful, you had no, no money left for the lobby. You know, you'd have, you'd have, you couldn't afford any nice materials. So you had to be very, very rational in your system so that you could have some, some money left over to actually finish the building nicely. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, I, I'm curious about what your thoughts are on kind of technology transfer, if you will, from this kind of high-end research to more modest constructions or engineering feats or or so forth you know just think a lot of the a lot of the precedents that you showed you know obviously are constrained in time in their time mm -hmm. and therefore a certain scale or size but are you seeing uh, certain kind of approaches here that get pulled off and attached to much smaller more humble um, projects and is that something you're interested in yeah I think a lot of this stuff is pretty portable you know, a lot, of the, a lot of this technology is really could be done by a mom and pop shop if you know it's out there. You know, in our work, we publish everything we do. Uh, you know, Ben Johnson's been here to talk about the timber tower. That's, we don't patent it. We make it available. Uh, you know, so it's, um, so you, you try, try to make this stuff, stuff available. We're trying to raise the industry. Uh, but you know, a lot, of the, a lot of this stuff is accessible, and, and I found like a lot of times even the, the construction side is getting really sophisticated. 
you know, they're using all this uh, modern technology, really, you know, where you do your iPhone or your iPad or whatever, and all this information, cameras all over the place and measuring things and surveying. Like I was, I was, I was touring a construction site. It's kind of a fairly ordinary uh, tall building in Chicago, and the and the technology was very sophisticated uh, because it's it's becoming so accessible. And so I, I, you know, I think, you know, I think part of it is just getting well educated, you know, knowing what's out there, and and staying tuned up because you know, for all the students here, everything you know is going to be has the shelf life of a banana. Okay. You got to you got to keep stay up with the industry. You got to go to conferences and find out who's doing what and what's the next next the next next. Uh, but also you got to sit down and, and and do it and think. And I actually do most of my preliminary design with a pencil and a piece of paper. Uh, and a and a and a calc. I do I do use a handheld calculator. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, you know, because a lot of times I find at the very very beginning, uh, if you constrain yourself. To very simple things, you have to make the problem very simple. Because you know we can make these things un unbelievably complex. Now everyone in this room is much more computer savvy. I used to be a computer jock in, in my day, but I, you know, I do my preliminary designs. I'm not very good at freehand drawing, so I have to use a straight edge. But you know, this is this is how I do my preliminary design. You, you know, in like the Burj Khalifa is a giant beam. It is a moment of inertia. There's a section modulus, you know, as a radius of gyration, you know, just calculate as a giant beam by hand. Okay. Oops, I lost my straight edge. <laughs> well, question number two. Um, I'm also curious about looking forward on the horizon. What do you see? as new materials, not just for structure, but you know, in building and whatever we use. What do you see in materials research? Well, you know, I mean, with all this nanotechnology, I mean, people are designing things at molecular level. And I, I think we're, you know, you know, ceramics, yeah, ceramics. You, you know, like, you know, this concrete, I, I don't know, Bob, is it a ceramic at some point? <laughs> I, you, you know, uh, so, you know, I, I remember I was working with this, this um, metallurgists up at Northwestern. And you know, they, it used to be they, they'd go to a, like a steel mill and they'd throw a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and they'd do a casting, and, and they test the properties. And you know, while it didn't work, they try something else. Now they go out there, they do a little test batch, they get exactly what they predicted because of the, the computer. So uh, what are we saying? Well, you know, concrete is very different. You're talking about uh, other materials. You know, all, of course, all this 3D printing, you know, additive manufacturing, you know, that's going to really, you know, a lot of people working, it's going to really take off very, very soon in that practical application. A lot of just meat and potatoes directors are doing, looking at it now because they, they see it's coming and they want to get in front of it. Um, the um, things like bamboo, a good piece of wood. No, it's wood, it's grass, right? Uh, you know, it it's actually has better, some ways better than normal like pine, uh, but you get you know, all the with the, with the adhesives, you got to get ahead of those. Um, so, uh, you know, you know, I talked about, you know, like, it is true, the two things, I said geometry, but it's geometry and materials. You know, those are the things that are going to, that are going to be essentially change, you know. And so the question, question is, can you, can you, as designers, create something new and be the first to interpret it? Like, um, you know, uh, if you ever go to look at um, Unity Temple by Frank Lloyd Wright in Oak Park, uh, just down the street is a, is a fake Gothic, uh, a Methodist church, a fake Gothic Methodist church, okay? And in 1905, when Frank Lloyd Wright did this, reinforced concrete was just coming out of patent. So before that, it was held up by patent, so not everybody could play, okay? So all of a sudden he could play. And, and when you think about it, he took... That was architecture coming out of the formwork. It's architecturally expressed. It's, a, it's architectural concrete, right? You know, you know, he did the formwork. You know, he formed it. You come out. The structure is the architecture, and it's, and he did it. and He interpreted it first. Fry Otto created all this technology, and he interpreted it first. You know, and you know, you end up, you know, the first people who did the, um, the post-tension concrete. You know, if you come up with a new technology, a new new system or new material, you it will. It can lead to new architecture. If you can do it first, you can interpret it first, you know, and play with it. So. Uh, 